Hello, my name is Julie Terrio, and I'm a professor at Stanford University. I'm delighted to be taking part in this iBio seminar series. And in the first part of my presentation today, I would like to talk about protein polymers, crawling cells, and comet tails. One of the things I find absolutely fascinating about biological systems is how the enormous complexity that we see in living cells and living organisms can arise by the assembly of relatively small and simple subunits or parts. For example, the protein structure uh, that's shown here is uh, one of the most abundant proteins in eukaryotic cells called actin. It also happens to be my favorite protein. And it's a small globular protein, uh, not particularly distinguished in terms of its overall shape. It has the capacity to bind and hydrolyze uh, ATP. However, it also has the capacity to self-assemble, to make filaments made up of many copies, many identical copies of the same protein. And by that self-assembly process, actin and other cytoskeletal proteins like it are able to elaborate tremendously complicated structures inside of living cells, giving rise to shapes like the beautiful Purkinje cell that's shown here in this classic drawing by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. So to me, this is one of the most profound problems facing our understanding of cell biology is to try to figure out what are the rules by which these tiny nanometer scale proteins can come together and organize themselves in order to make structures that are many orders of magnitude larger, 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth orders of magnitude larger. And that question becomes even more profound, I think, and even more puzzling when we realize that in the context of biological structures, everything is dynamic. This is certainly true of the cytoskeletal elements. And I think that's really beautifully illustrated by this classic movie of a neutrophil chasing down bacteria. This movie was made by David Rogers at Vanderbilt University in the 1950s. And what we're looking at here is a blood smear, where the little round dark objects are red blood cells. The uh, white blood cell is labeled there in the middle. And you'll see right at the front end of the white blood cell is a, a tiny little pair of bacteria. Now, when the movie starts to play, you can appreciate that the white blood cell is very well organized. It has a definite front and a definite back. But it's also very active. So it's chasing after that bacterium. As the bacterium is bouncing around because of fluid motion uh, in the background, uh, the neutrophil is able to change direction and keep going after the little bacterium until finally it's going to catch up and then engulf it, which is its biological function. Now, that happens to be a human neutrophil, uh, probably taken from David Rogers' own blood. But if we look at other types of eukaryotic cells, we can find examples like this amoeba. This is Acanthamoeba castellanii, which lives in the soil. And it also makes a living by crawling around and eating bacteria. And when we watch it move under the microscope, it looks actually remarkably similar to the movement of the human neutrophil. It would really take an expert to be able to tell the difference between these two different cells. And yet these two cell types have been separated by about 2 billion years of evolution. Now, we appreciate today that not only is the overall appearance and motility quite similar between these two different cells, but also the fundamental molecular machinery that drives the motion has also been conserved all of this time. And one of the most important elements of that fundamental molecular machinery is the actin uh, that self-assembles into filaments, as I just told you about. If we look at the leading edge of a crawling cell, and in this particular case, the image on the bottom here is a fixed cytoskeleton from a cell called a keratocyte. We can label the actin filaments in that cell and see the overall distribution. In this particular case, they're uh, very much focused uh, towards the, the front, towards the leading edge. And in this uh, beautiful electron micrograph by Tanya Svetkina, you can see uh, at the ultrastructural level exactly how abundant and how densely intertwined and cross-linked these actin filaments actually are. The top shows a relatively low magnification. And then the bottom part here shows uh, individual boxes uh, magnified from the, the marked portions in the top, where you can see the actin filaments are not only cross-linked to each other, but also actually branching off one another to make this large structure that is able to push the cell forward. Now, when we think about how these tiny little nanometer scale proteins are able to assemble into such an enormous structure that's able to perform this vast amount of physical work of pushing a whole cell forward, uh, the most important place to start is just with the filament itself. Um, as I mentioned, actin is a globular protein. Again, its uh, specific molecular structure is shown here at the top. And uh, this image gives you a sense of, uh, at the structural level, how all those monomers are able to come together in order to make a filament. Now, this textbook diagram uh, over here emphasizes another very, very important aspect of actin behavior, which is critical for understanding motility. And that's the fact that it's able to bind and hydrolyze nucleotide. And although this diagram is somewhat oversimplified, the point is that when actin is bound to ATP, it uh, has a propensity to assemble into filaments. 
Once it enters the filament, the hydrolytic activity of actin is activated. And so within the filament, the ATP is converted to ADP. Once that has happened, the ADP-containing filaments are relatively less stable, and those monomers are able to come off again. Now, the consequence of this is as long as there's free ATP present, actin will bind ATP, assemble into a filament, hydrolyze, disassemble, and keep this going in a treadmilling-type cycle indefinitely. And it's that assembly and disassembly that actually drives a lot of the dynamic movements of cells that we'll be talking about. A few other important things to bear in mind about actin when we're thinking about how it works inside of a living cell is that in order to form a filament, it's nucleation that's the rate limiting step. So there's lots of actin monomers floating around all the time. Some of them are bound to uh, other proteins that modulate their propensity to make filaments. But when three of them come together, or when they're catalyzed to come together by a specialized nucleating protein, that's the initiating event that will allow filament elongation to begin. Because of the constant hydrolysis of ATP in this process of assembly and disassembly, equilibrium is never reached inside of a cell. All the actin filaments are always constantly turning over. This is obviously true in something like the neutrophil that has to rearrange all its actin filaments so fast in order to crawl. But it's also true, uh, although to a somewhat lesser extent, in cells like skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle where the actin filaments are relatively static. Always there's ATP hydrolysis and always there's some kind of turnover associated with the filament structures. In the kinds of cells we're going to be focusing on, so rapidly moving cells, the average half-life of the filaments is on the order of a few tens of seconds or maybe a few minutes at most. And they're organized in order to make these large-scale structures that can span throughout the entire cell and govern its behavior by literally hundreds of different kinds of actin binding molecules that uh, bind along the filaments, regulate their assembly and disassembly, cross-link them, sever them, bundle them together. Anything you can imagine that a protein can do to these filamentous structures, there's probably some protein out there that does it. And one of the things I particularly want to focus on in our discussion today is uh, this last fact down at the bottom here, that polymerization of actin, and also actually of tubulin into microtubules, can actually generate physical force, very similar to the way that a molecular motor can generate physical force. And in the context of cell motility, like those movies I just showed you, it's actually the assembly of actin at the leading edge that is thought to be one of the major drivers of that particular kind of motion. So let's take a step back for a minute and think about how it is that polymerization of a protein actually can lead to physical force. One way I find helpful to think about it is to imagine the protein polymerization reaction simply as a biochemical binding reaction, where on the left-hand side, we have a small filament that's four subunits long and a free subunit. Those are going to be the reactants. When they bind to each other with some on rate designated by K on, they'll make a filament that's one subunit longer. That will be the product. And because this is just a binding reaction, it can go to equilibrium. And the ratio between the K on and the K off is going to give you um, some equilibrium constant, which for cytoskeletal proteins we call C crit. That stands for critical concentration. Now, if we think about a filament like this that is growing uh, not at equilibrium, but rather is growing with some sort of uh, non-equilibrium situation in its environment, we can end up with a situation like what's illustrated at the top here. If we have excess monomers present, so that is you know, just one little filament and lots of monomers, but more than would be present at equilibrium, then those filaments will tend to polymerize. Because we have excess monomers, that will put us in a regime where polymerization is favored thermodynamically. In other words, the delta G for this binding reaction is going to be negative overall. Now, if we imagine taking one of those little filaments and putting it between, on the one side, a rigid barrier like a wall, and on the other side, a smaller barrier that can move back and forth, as long as the free energy that is released by the polymerization reaction is greater than or equal to the amount of work that it takes to move that little black barrier through that distance delta, then the overall polymerization reaction will still be favored, and the barrier will be pushed forward. So using that kind of very fundamental thermodynamic energetic argument, uh, Terrell Hill and Mark Kirshner in 1982 wrote this uh, fabulous 125-page manifesto describing all the different ways that protein polymerization and depolymerization could be used to generate force. And um, from their calculations, uh, they came up with this simple rule about the max amount of force that can be generated by polymerization of a filament. It depends on the size of the monomer, delta, and depends on the concentration of free monomers in solution relative to this critical concentration of the equilibrium binding constant. So if you calculate for actin inside of a living cell what those numbers actually should turn out to be, 
we estimate that the amount of force you should be able to get from a single actin filament is on the order of actually 5 to 10 piconewtons, which surprisingly is just about the same amount of force that you get from a real molecular motor like myosin or kinesin. So although this kind of polymerization driven motion is maybe not as familiar, not as intuitive, it's actually a perfectly good motor and it can generate just as much force as something like myosin. Now thinking about how fast processes can be driven in this way is a little bit different from thinking about the energetics. In order to understand how fast things go, we have to have some sort of kinetic model. And in particular, when we're thinking about a filament that's polymerizing up against a barrier, we have to have some idea in mind about how that space can be opened up for another monomer to come and sneak onto the end of the filament and extend the filament and then push the barrier. And George Oster and his colleagues have done a lot of interesting calculations assuming different kinds of thermal flexibility in different components of the system. For example, you could imagine the barrier is able to move back and forth, or you could imagine the filament is able to flex up and down a little bit, or you could imagine the crosslinks between the filaments maybe can move uh, their angles. All of those things can give you enough space to allow actin monomers to come in and continue the polymerization reaction and generate force to physically move the barrier forward. And doing some reasonable calculations about how fast those kinds of things should be able to happen in the context of a living cell, they've been able to estimate that this very non-intuitive reaction is enough, is fast enough to drive processes even like the extension of that neutrophil as it's chasing a bacteria. So those are calculations. Of course, it's always very satisfying to be able to see an experimental result that confirms the uh, models that have been put forth. And a few years ago, uh, Matt Footer in my lab, uh, together with our collaborators, Marilyn Doctorum and Jakob Kursemachers in Amsterdam, were able to actually measure the force of actin polymerization directly. And the way that they did this was to prepare a very stiff, uh, rigid actin bundle from the sperm of the horseshoe crab. It's called an acrosome. And those acrosomes can grow actin filaments off of one tip. So after preparing the acrosomes and making sure they were able to polymerize actin, uh, Matt and Jakob put those acrosomes into a special kind of optical trap that had been invented in Marlene's lab in order to pull this structure where here is the, uh, the filament bundle and then there's a bead that is being held onto by the optical trap and bring it up against a microfabricated wall. In that configuration then, when the bead is pushing up against the wall, when we add actin monomers uh, to that mixture, the actin monomers, uh, given the thermal fluctuations of the bead and the trap, are able to sneak in between the end of the acrosome and the wall and actually extend that bundle of actin filaments and push the bead out of the trap. We're able to measure very precisely exactly how far the bead has moved out of the trap and use that to measure the amount of force that's generated in this experiment. And what they were able to find was that the actin filament will continue to grow, as you see in this trace, until it reaches a stall where uh, the force is exactly balanced um, by the pushing against the wall. And the force that they can uh, measure for these small bundles of actin filaments is on the order of a few piconewtons, one or two piconewtons, which is very close to what that thermodynamic uh, prediction would have guessed uh, under the, the conditions that we used. So it's very satisfying to see here we've got one filament is able to actually directly generate a force that we can measure. But if we want to think about how this works in the context of cell motility, we actually have to think about many filaments working together. And this kind of experiment is not really going to help us understand what the rules are that govern the cooperation among a whole gang of filaments that are operating over a very large uh, area of space. In order to get some mechanistic insight into this question of what happens when many actin filaments are trying to work together, we've actually been able to learn a tremendous amount from a completely different area of biology. Um, and that's actually the field of bacterial pathogenesis. So it turns out that infectious bacteria and also viruses that live inside of mammalian hosts and exploit the resources of the mammalian host's body in order to replicate and in order to spread actually turn out to be excellent cell biologists. They know all the little details, all the little ins and outs of exactly how mammalian cells work, exactly what the most important aspects are for things like their replication or their motion, so that the pathogens can take advantage of those properties of their host cells in order to perform whatever it is the pathogen wishes to perform. One of the examples of a pathogen, a bacterial pathogen, that's turned out to be a really outstanding cell biologist is this organism here, Listeria monocytogenes. Now, Listeria is a common soil organism, um, and all of us eat a little bit of it every day when we eat a salad or something. But when we consume food that is very heavily contaminated with Listeria, 
This can be something like a cantaloupe or chicken or sometimes ice cream. Uh, then the bacteria are actually able to invade the mammalian host cells that line our intestines. And for most healthy adults, this infection is self-limiting. You never even know you had it. But for people who are immunocompromised or for pregnant women, the infection can actually spread throughout the entire body. And what we're looking at here in the micrograph is a single mammalian host cell that has been uh, grown in tissue culture and that was infected with probably one bacterium about five hours before this movie was made. And you can see the bacteria have been replicating in the cytoplasm. Uh, there are each of these little dark uh, bullet-shaped objects that you see. And what I hope you'll appreciate uh, when I start to play the movie is that these bacteria are able to not only replicate in the host cell cytoplasm, but they're also able to do this absolutely extraordinary thing, which is uh, they can cruise around like little speedboats. And in fact, the motion of these uh, bacteria inside the cytoplasm of the host cell is driven by the assembly of host cell actin filaments. So behind each of the little bacteria that's moving, you can see a phase-dense streak. And that's actually the, what's called a comet tail that is the uh, actin left behind uh, the bacterium as it moved. Now we can see, for example, in this uh, fluorescence micrograph that those filaments, those comet tails, are made of host cell actin, where here the bacteria have been labeled red with a fluorophore, and then the actin filaments in the host cell have been labeled in green. You can see every bacterium that's inside the cell is associated either with a little cloud or else with one of these comet tails uh, of actin filaments. And looking a little more closely at the level of the electron microscope, you can see the way that those filaments are arranged in this incredibly dense cross-linked structure uh, that traces behind the bacterium and records the path that it traveled over. Now, having analyzed some of the dynamic behavior of the actin filaments associated with bacterial comet tails, what I can tell you is that the assembly of all the filaments in this comet tail took place right at the bacterial surface. And it was actually the assembly of those actin filaments up against that smooth cell wall of the bacterium that generated the force to push the bacterium through the cytoplasm of its host cell. As we move further back in the comet tail, the actin filaments stay cross-linked to one another uh, to make this very nice, tight, characteristic collimated line. And the filaments actually remain stationary in the cytoplasm, like the wake behind a boat, as a history of where the bacterium has moved. And then finally, at the back end of the comet tail, the old filaments fall apart because their ATP has been hydrolyzed. They get disassembled by accessory factors in order to regenerate actin monomers that can then rejoin the actin monomer pool, diffuse around the cell, and come back to the front where they can continue to generate force. So part of the reason that this particular organism has been so appealing as a way to study the cooperation among many actin filaments is because it is particularly amenable to both biophysical and biochemical manipulation. So for example, on the biochemical side, we were able to reconstitute the movement of this bacterium in cytoplasmic extracts uh, more than 20 years ago now. And then a series of biochemists uh, started fractionating extracts and trying combinations of ideas of different proteins they thought might contribute to this process, until in 1999, a really heroic piece of work from Marie-France Carlier's lab was able to demonstrate motility of these bacteria using a mixture of only purified proteins that had all been completely identified. Now, in the meantime, we were also able to actually get rid of the bacterium and replace it with a polystyrene bead, which you see, sorry, which you see right here. Um, that polystyrene bead is coated with actually just a single protein from the bacterium, which is enough to initiate this whole reaction and grow this beautiful comet tail that looks very much like the comet tail associated with the real bacterium. And in fact, when we put those beads under the microscope, uh, what we can see here with labeled actin is that those beads actually jet around and in fact look exactly like the bacteria do. So this is something that can be reconstituted both biochemically and biophysically with these artificial substrates. So based on those kinds of experiments, over a period of about 10 years, about 20 different labs contributed to understanding the roles of all the different proteins associated with this form of motility, identifying the proteins, figuring out their roles, and figuring out how they all work together. So to summarize all this work, we're going to focus right on the surface of the bacterium, which is where all the action takes place. And the first step in motility is that the bacterium has to express a particular protein. For Listeria monocytogenes, it happens to be called ACT-A. For other bacteria that do the same kind of trick, they express other proteins that, interestingly enough, actually evolved independently from MACDA. So it seems like this mechanism for pathogen actin-based motility has actually appeared multiple times uh, in evolution in apparently completely unrelated strains of bacteria. Uh, 
when that protein is presented on the surface of the bacterial cell, it's able to bind to particular factors in the host cell cytoplasm that are critical for nucleation of actin filaments. And remember that nucleation is the rate limiting step. So for uh, the ACT A protein from Listeria monostogenes, it binds directly to the nucleating complex called the ARP23 complex that is then able to first bind to the side of a pre-existing actin filament that's already in the tail, and then nucleate the growth of a new actin filament in a branch off of the side of that old actin filament. And you'll remember, you saw branches like that in the electron micrographs at the leading edge of a crawling cell. It's thought to work by a very similar process. Now, as those filaments are nucleated, they grow by addition of actin monomers that are present um, in the uh, cytoplasm, just floating around uh, and landing on the ends of those filaments by diffusion. And that growth, as I said, pushes uh, the bacterium through the cytoplasm using this force generation mechanism that I described. Now, this whole thing doesn't require any classical molecular motors. There's no involvement of myosin or any of its relatives in this process. As the bacterium moves forward, it leaves those actin filaments behind, including leaving the branch junctions behind. And those old filaments, as they're ripped off the surface of the bacterium based on the motion of the bacterium, get capped by proteins like CAPZ or gelsalin so that they don't continue to grow out of control. And that keeps the comet tail in its nice, characteristic, narrow shape. And then finally, depolymerizing proteins, things like cofilin and ADF, will come in and disassemble those filaments, tear them apart into uh, their native monomers, so that the whole thing, again, can continue uh, indefinitely as long as the bacterium is present in a cytoplasm that has these factors there. So thinking about this mechanism, which we understand in a lot of molecular detail, there's several things about it that I still find absolutely astonishing. So one is just that it works so incredibly fast. And to put numbers on that, uh, here's the image of Listeria monocytogenes. This organism is about 2 microns long, and its uh, typical speed is about 0.2 microns per second. And it's moving at that rate by piling up all these tiny little actin monomers that are only about 4 nanometers in diameter. Now, it's hard to really judge, is that fast, is that slow? So let's compare it to some macroscopic thing for which we have some physical intuition about what's fast or slow. And my uh, former student, Fred Sue, pointed out that the geometry of the Listeria moving with its comet tail is actually very similar to the geometry of the Ohio-class nuclear submarine. Uh, just like the bacterium, it's a cylinder that's capped on two ends with its hemispheres. As it moves through its medium, it leaves behind these characteristic curving patterns behind it. Uh, and with the nuclear submarine, uh, we know that the length of that is about 560 feet, and its typical cruising speed is about 30 feet per second. So what would it mean if we scaled up Listeria to be as big as the submarine? Well, in order to do that, we'd have to have the actin monomers go from being 4 nanometers to being about the size of a basketball, or about a foot across. And if we do that scaling, and then see how does that apply to the uh, other numbers I've shown you here for length and speed, it turns out that if actin monomers were the size of a basketball, then the length of the bacterium would be about 500 feet, so very comparable to the submarine, uh, and its speed would be about 50 feet per second. So it can go just as fast as the submarine. And the astonishing thing about this fact is what it means is if you were in a satellite watching submarines cruising around on the surface of the ocean, the movies of that would look exactly identical to the movie that I showed you before of Listeria motility. It's really just the same thing, just scaled up massively. But the thing that's most amazing is the submarine is just moving through water. But the bacterium is moving through cytoplasm. And cytoplasm is dense. Cytoplasm is filled with all of these cytoskeletal filaments. It's chock full of organelles. There's all sorts of things in the way. And if you actually try to calculate what the equivalent would be, it's not like a bacterium, or sorry, it's not like a submarine moving through water. It's actually a lot closer to a submarine moving through concrete. So it must be the case that the bacterium is generating a tremendous amount of force with this coordinated assembly of the actin filaments in its common tail. Okay, again, it'd be nice to see some experimental data that can tell us something about how much force is actually being generated. Well, one way you can get a bit of an intuitive feel for that is by looking at these uh, beautiful movies made by my former student, Catherine Lacayo, where she has labeled the mitochondria in a host cell with a red dye, and the bacteria are expressing GFP, so you see them in green. And as the movie plays, we can watch the bacteria move around and can see actually what happens when they run into a mitochondria. And remember, mitochondria are about the same size as bacteria. Uh, long in the distant past, they actually used to be bacteria. Uh, so this is a pretty equal battle. 
And if we zoom in, and you see the bacterium is going to, as the movie loops back, you'll see it come in from the top. Here it comes. And it just slices its way right through that big pile of mitochondria. It shoves them aside without really even slowing down at all. So this has got to be a lot of force to be able to just push all the organelles in the cell out of the way. Now, Dan Fletcher, when he was a postdoc in my lab, uh, he's now a professor at UC Berkeley, um, he worked out this uh, really very clever technique for measuring large forces uh, using this kind of uh, actin polymerization geometry. And what he did was he took advantage of the fact that we could reconstitute motility on those little polystyrene beads, and then just took one of those little acte coated polystyrene beads and stuck it on the end of an AFM cantilever. And what this meant was he could then bring that cantilever down to a glass surface, allow the actin polymerization to occur in between the tip of the cantilever and the glass, and that would push the cantilever upward in a way that he could measure the displacement and therefore also measure the force. And looking at these um, traces, there's a couple of things that are very astonishing about them. The most astonishing one actually being the stall force, which you see up here uh, for a bead attached to the end of a cantilever is on the order of about 300 nanonewtons. Now remember, before we were talking about piconewtons. So it's really clear that when you get a whole bunch of actin filaments together, they're able to cooperate with one another in order to generate tremendous amounts of force. And based on estimates that Dan's been able to do of the density of the actin filaments in that gel, if you then estimate how much force comes from a single actin filament, then again we get down to numbers that are on the order of about a few piconewtons per filament, which is again what was calculated uh, originally from the thermodynamic argument, what we measured for single filaments, and what also seems to be fulfilled now in the context of this branching growth of a network against the surface of, in this case, a cantilever, or in the cell against the surface of a bacterium. So overall, what I've told you about is a set of processes that are essentially based simply on the self-organization and self-assembly of tiny little nanometer scale protein subunits in order to make an ensemble that is much, much greater than the sum of its parts in terms of its ability to do real physical work, such as pushing a bacterium around inside of a cell. And part of the reason that this is interesting is because it applies not only to the context of the bacteria moving around, but also to what's happening actually at the leading edge of a crawling cell. Basically, you can think of the bacterium as imitating a little fragment of a crawling cell's uh, membrane, plasma membrane. And the growth of these branching actin filaments up against that membrane are pushing the edge of the cell forward in the same way that they push the bacteria around inside of the cells or in extracts. Now, there's obviously a lot more to say about how all of these ideas apply to the actual problem of cell motility. And if you'd like to hear more about that, uh, please come back for part two. Finally, I'd like to end by uh, acknowledging the absolutely amazing team of colleagues that I've had working on this project now for many years. I've listed here uh, the members of my group who have participated in various different aspects of characterization of the cell biology and biophysics of listeria. And in particular today, I showed experiments that were done by Matthew Footer, by Lisa Cameron, uh, by uh, Catherine Lacayo, and um, also by Dan Fletcher. And uh, we've also uh, had the privilege of just absolutely wonderful collaborators. Uh, the most important one I want to draw attention to is Dan Portnoy at UC Berkeley, who's been a close collaborator for uh, almost 25 years now uh, on all of these processes associated with listeria motility. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>